friends, uh, we continue in reading through John Newton, Letters of a Slave Trader, Freed by God's Grace. Um, and we're on to chapter 3. My early life as a sailor. My dear Harveys, the folks I went to visit were intimate friends of my mother's. Because their interest in our family had cooled after father's second marriage, I'd heard nothing of them for, for many years. Actually, I was not all that interested in going to see them, and I almost passed by without going in, but I did go in. I was recognized at first sight and shown the kindest reception as the child of a dear deceased friend. These folks had two daughters. The eldest, as I learned some years later, had been considered by her mother and mine as a future wife for me from the time of her birth. I would not say that what mother predicted was ever going to happen, but I felt there was something remarkable about it all when I learned of it. Any kind of arrangement between the two families had, of course, broken off long before, and now I was going off to a foreign country and had only called to say goodbye. But almost from my very first sight of this girl, she was then under 14, I felt an affection for her that never faded or lost its influence for a single moment in my heart. In its intensity, it equaled all that the writers of romance have imagined. I knew it would endure forever. Even though soon after this I lost all sense of religion and became deaf to any of the cautions of my conscience, none of the misery I experienced ever banished her a single hour from my waking thoughts for seven years following. Hardly anything less than this violent and commanding passion would have been sufficient to waken me from the gloominess I had sunk into. And later, when I made shipwreck of my faith, hope and conscience, my love for this person was the only remaining principle that in any degree took their place. The bare possibility that I might see her again was the only thing restraining me from crimes against myself and others. Courtship normally is a time for pleasantries, mutual affection, the consent of friends, and a date to look forward to, especially when it is governed by the will and fear of God. But I did not dare mention this to her friends or to my own, nor for a long time to her. I could not make any proposals or give any indication to anyone because a dark fire was locked up in my breast, a fire that, was un that uniquely gave me a constant uneasiness and greatly weakened my sense of religion. In fact, it opened the way for all sorts of foolishness in my private life. Though my love for her seemed to be an incentive for me to do great things to make her proud of me, in reality, when you come right down to the bottom line, it didn't make me a better man. Oh, I had great resolves, but they didn't produce a thing. But I did realize that it would be absolutely impossible for me to live as far away as Jamaica for four or five years. So I decided I would not go. I was afraid to tell my father the real reason, and I was afraid to lie to him. So without giving him any notice, I stayed three weeks in Kent instead of three days. I figured that by the time I got back to London, the ship would have sailed and the opportunity I had been planning would have evaporated. I was right. When I returned to London, I learned that my father was, indeed, angry at my disobedience, but not as angry as I had imagined. A short time later, I sailed with a friend of my father's to Venice. The common sailors on board were certainly not the finest examples of decency and order, but they were fun to be with. I began to relax from the sober self-discipline I had cultivated for the last two years. Though I made a few faint efforts to stop, I never recovered from this decline as I had from the ones that preceded it. I was now making large strides toward total apostasy from God. The most remarkable warning I received, and the last one, was a dream that made a very strong, though not a lasting, impression on my mind. The scene was the harbour of Venice where we had just been. I thought it was night and that it was my turn to stand watch on the dock. As I was walking to and fro by myself, a man brought me a ring with the express order to keep it carefully. He assured me that while I preserved that ring, I would be happy and successful. But if I lost it or parted with it, I could expect nothing but trouble and misery. 
I accepted the present and the terms willingly, knowing that I would indeed care for it, and gloating that now I would have my happiness in my own keeping. Then a second person came to me and, seeing the ring on my finger, asked some questions about it. I readily told him its value, and he said he was astonished that I was so gullible in expecting such effects from a mere ring. He argued with me for some time and then urged me to throw the ring away. At first I was shocked at such a suggestion, but he kept telling me how foolish I was. Then I began to consider his reasons and to doubt the original story. At last I pulled it off from my finger and dropped it over the ship's side into the water. At the same instant a terrible fire burst out from a range of mountains some distance behind the city of Venice. I saw the hills as distinctly as if I were awake, and they were all in flames. Too late I realized how foolish I'd been. My tempter, with an insulting sneer, informed me that all the mercy of God reserved for me was lodged in the ring I had willfully thrown away. He said I would have to go with him to the burning mountains and that all the flames I saw had been kindled on my account. I trembled in great agony, but the dream continued. As I stood there, hopelessly condemning myself, a third person, or the same one who brought the ring the first time, I'm not certain which, came to me, demanding to know why I was grieving. I told him plainly, confessing that I'd ruined myself willfully and deserved no pity. He blamed my foolishness and asked if I would be any wiser the next time if I had my ring back again. I could hardly answer. I thought it was gone for good. Before I even had time to answer, this unexpected friend plunged into the water just at the spot where I dropped the ring. He returned in a moment, bringing it with him. The moment he came on board, the flames in the mountains were extinguished and my evil seducer left me. With joy and gratitude, I went up to my kind deliverer with my hand open to receive my ring again. But he refused to return it. He said, If you were to be entrusted with this ring again, you would soon bring yourself into the same distress. You are not able to keep it, so I will preserve it for you. Whenever you need it, I will produce it in your behalf. I awoke astonished. I could hardly eat, sleep or work for two or three days. But the impression soon wore off, and I totally forgot it. It hardly returned to my mind until several years later. A time was coming soon, though I didn't know it then, when I would find myself in circumstances very nearly resembling the one suggested by this dream. Had my mind been open, I would have recognized my grand enemy seducing me to willfully renounce my religious professions and involve myself in his complicated crimes. I would have seen that he was delighted with my agonies, waiting only for permission to seize and bear my soul away to his place of torment. I would also have seen Jesus, whom I had persecuted and defied, rebuking the adversary and claiming me for his own. He would have plucked me as a brand from the fire and declared to Satan, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Though my eyes were not opened, I had obtained mercy. The day would come when the Lord would answer for me in the day of my distress. He who restored the ring, or what it signified, promised to keep it. I later found unspeakable comfort in this, that I am not in my own keeping. The Lord is my shepherd. I know whom I believed. See 2 Timothy 1.12. My shepherd has won my trust. Satan still desires to have me so that he can sift me as wheat. But my Saviour has prayed for me that my faith may not fail. See Luke 22:31. He is my security and power, my bulwark against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. But for this, many times since my first deliverance, I would have ruined myself. I fall, I stumble. I would have perished if his faithfulness had not been active in my behalf. He is my sun and shield, even unto death. See Psalm 84.11. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Nothing very remarkable occurred during the remainder of the voyage. I returned home in December 1743 and soon went again to Kent. I stayed there too long again and disappointed my father so greatly that he almost disowned me. 
Before anything suitable in the way of vocation opened up for me, I was caught by the military after another piece of foolishness on my part and put on board a tender. Military tensions were aggravated by the presence of the French fleets off the English coasts. My father was not able to procure my release. In a few days, I was transferred to the ship Howick, where I entered an entirely new scene of life. I endured a great deal of hardship for about a month. My father decided then that I should remain in the Navy, as war was expected daily. He procured a recommendation to the captain who elevated me to midshipman. I now had an easier life, and had my behaviour been different, might have gained respect from my superiors. Instead, I met with companions who completed the ruin of my morals. Outwardly I looked conservative and polite, but inwardly my delight and habitual practice was wickedness. My chief friend was a genial young man with few scruples. He knew how to argue me down and impress me with his opinions in the most plausible way. He was fun to be with. He was interested in the few books I had, and I was eager enough to show him how well read I was. He soon perceived that I still had standards he, he had not broken down, and he began on a program to gain my confidence. He spoke rather favourably of religion at first. Then he began to undermine my attachment to the characteristics by Lord Shaftesbury. He argued with me and convinced me that I never had understood it in the first place. He soon convinced me, and I went his way with all my heart. I guess I was like the unwary sailor who leaves port just as the storm is rising. I renounced the hopes and comforts of the gospel at the very time when every other comfort was about to fail me. Later, on a voyage to Lisbon, my friend was in a ship caught by a violent storm. The vessel and people escaped, but a great wave broke on board, sweeping him into eternity. In December 1744, the Howick was in harbour, but scheduled for a trip to the East Indies. The captain gave me liberty to go on shore for a day. Ignoring the consequences, I rented a horse and raced to take a last leave of the one I loved. I knew all the time I was there that I was getting more and more deeply in trouble back at the ship. The short time I stayed with her passed like a dream. On New Year's Day I returned to the ship. I begged the captain to excuse my absence, which he did. But since this wasn't the first stunt I'd pulled, I lost his confidence for good. When we did sail, we moved out of harbour with a very large fleet. The following night several ships were lost, trying to get out to sea. A storm from the south had struck the coast of Cornwall. The darkness of the night and the close proximity of so many vessels caused a great deal of confusion and damage. Our ship, though several times in imminent danger of being run down by other vessels, escaped unhurt. So many ships suffered that we had to put back to Plymouth. While we were there, I learned that my father had come down to a city nearby. He had a connection at that time with another shipping company, and I thought that if I could just get to him, he might be able to secure a position for me on another ship that would be better than pursuing a long, uncertain voyage on the Howick to the East Indies. It was a principle of my life at that time that I would never think twice about anything I wanted to do. The thought had hardly occurred to me before I resolved to leave the ship, no matter what it cost. I did so in a typically foolish way. I sent in a boat one day to take care that none of the other people deserted, but I betrayed my trust and went off myself. I didn't know what road to take and didn't dare ask for fear of being suspected a deserter. I had some general idea of the country and guessed right. I travelled for a number of miles and then found on inquiry that I was on the road to Dartmouth. All went smoothly that day and part of the next. I was about two hours walk from my father when I was met by a small party of soldiers. I could not avoid or deceive them. They knew I was a deserter. They walked me back to Plymouth guarding me like a criminal. I was embarrassed and full of shame and very real fear. They confined, confined me in the guardhouse for two days before sending me back on board my ship, where I was kept in irons at first, and then stripped and whipped in front of everybody. Finally, I was degraded from my office. All of my former companions were forbidden to show me the least kind of consideration. 
they could not even speak to me. As a midshipman, I'd had some authority, which I'd not been reluctant to exercise. But now that I had been brought down to a level with the lowest, I became the butt of everyone's jokes. If my present situation was bad, my future was worse. The officers and my former shipmates who had been my friends found it impossible to protect me from the abuse I had coming. They and I knew that they ran a risk of insubordination if they offered comfort to a man under discipline. On several occasions, the captain showed me how furious he was with me, and the voyage was to last for five years. I was totally miserable. Every hour brought some new insult and hardship, with no hope of relief or softening, and no friend to take my part or listen to my complaints. And worse, nothing I felt or feared distressed me so much as to know I was being torn away from the one I so dearly loved. Should she ever learn of the manner of my going, it would be doubtful that I could return with any hope of her being mine. I could see nothing but darkness and misery. I am sure that no one, except one whose conscience has been wounded by the wrath of God, could feel more dreadful than I did. I cannot express the wistfulness and regret with which I cast my last look on the English shoreline. I kept my eyes fixed on it until it disappeared. When I could see it no longer, I was tempted to throw myself overboard, ending all my sorrows at once. But the secret hand of God restrained me. Friends, we'll end there and pick it up next week at chapter 4. God bless you. Have a good week.